BBC One. Bob Langley and his well-travelled friends arrive in Whitby, now on BBC One, and discover it as the landing site of a certain count. in a long while just for the fun of it and who knows where ride from your home and arrive as a stranger turn to a friend and be welcome there an estuary port on the eastern coastline a fisherman's town by the north york moors there's a fine old abbey at the heart of whitby here count dracula reached these shores history. This year we celebrate our 154th birthday and it is as much a part of the history of Whitby as the seafaring traditions of Captain Cook and indeed part of our very important tourism calendar of the year. We yachts have a love-hate relationship with Whitby Bridge. Uh, it is open for economy. The Commodore salutes every boat that passes him on its way up to the marina at the far end of the harbour and that doesn't matter whether they're a trawler, a keelboat, a yacht, a raft, a rowing, whatever the boat is, he will salute them and he will expect a salute back. The original regatta started with the rowing clubs. It was started by them and forms very much the basis of this three-day event. The rowing clubs are the history of this ancient seaport. We're very proud of them and that's why we celebrate in this way the traditions that they gave to Whitby. There's the red, and there's the blue, and there's the Scarborough team as well. But it's a good sportsman's day out. I came to Whitby uh, in January of 1968, just for a visit. And it was a filthy black day. I came over the moors, saw the place, fell in love with it, and said, if there's a job going here, I'll take it and I've, I've never, never looked back. back. The official name is Whitby Glass Limited, but everyone know, knows us as the Lucky Duck Shop. 30% of our economy depends on tourism. We all depend on the visitors to the hotels and the wages from the people who work in the secondary side of the tourist industry. Quite honestly, there's a magic about Whitby. There's a pull to it. I, I've said it's like a gateway. The light here attracts photographers and painters. 
I just wish that they wouldn't leave their film curtains on the ground when they go away. <laughs> there certainly is a tradition of smuggling here. And during the late 1700s, there was an occasion when the excise men were trundling a cart of contraband liquor along my own street. And the mob knocked it over, smashed the kegs, and they lapped the gin out of the gutters. <laughs> no, don't ask me, would they do it today? You never, I wouldn't say. <laughs> There's a cohesion and a solidarity. There's a family feeling here that you'll not find in the city. And it's very strong. It's that family feeling that it needs to keep. Nowadays, Whitby Jet is something of a tourist attraction. And if it's jewellery you're after, there's plenty to choose from in the local shops. But a century ago, Whitby Jet production was a thriving industry here. And in this part of the old town, there's now a shrine to that Victorian past. The Victorian Jet Museum is actually an old workshop, preserved like a time capsule. And this is quite an interesting setup because it's the only one that we have left in Whitby. The reason that this was preserved is the fact that nobody knew it was here. It was discovered a few years ago by a, a local builder who had purchased a derelict cottage and in order to get to the roof, to mend the roof, had to knock a wall down. And when the wall came down, there was a Victorian jet workshop just behind it. There were no electricity in the middle of the Victorian times, and as you can see here, we've got a large wooden flywheel that was operated by a treadle, and around this flywheel would have been a leather strap attached to this small boss, and extremely fast speeds were attained, eight or 900 times a minute. So we find that the jet has been passed from this craftsman, the master craftsman, the carver, over to here. These wheels were responsible to put all those beautiful and intricate cuts into the um, jewellery. That was at the height of the jet industry. And it went on for a number of generations, but then it started to drop. And it dropped like a stone. Until it got to a point where you couldn't actually give it away. The cottage became more and more derelict, the buildings became more derelict, unattractive, and people forgot that there was the workshop there. And so 125 years later on, it was rediscovered. A little time capsule, personally interesting and very important for Whitby as well, because of the jet being such an enormous part of its cultural history. You can quite plainly see the black jet here. Imagine that as the log of a tree, because this is what the jet was and is. A fossil, a fossil of the Araucaria aracana, and commonly known as the monkey puzzle tree or Chilean pine. Now this tree grew extensively all over the land some 180 million years ago. And we find that we've got a geological fault of Jurassic rocks for seven and a half mile, and Whitby's right in the middle of this, so they have access to this geological fault, and of course the fossilized monkey puzzle tree. Well, of course, one of the most important things for me to pursue my own craft and my business is the acquisition of this raw material. We have a natural coastal erosion on the northeast coast, which is always going to nibble away at the cliffs, hopefully exposing another seam of jet. I go out there and be in the right place at the right time in order to acquire this jet. Cross maybe, but uh, really not worth the effort. Not really worth it. Four inches across the bottom and the very end of a seam. Very thin, but that might turn into something. Now we've got evidence that the, the Whitby jet was used for personal adornment as far back as the Bronze Age time. There's been necklaces found in burial mounds in Portillo. But it's fair to say that it became economically uh, viable in the Victorian times. Our young and happy Queen Victoria took a real fancy to the jet and wore it to court. 
Later on, it got this reputation for mourning because when she lost her beloved Albert, she went into a lengthy period of mourning, and of course, then it became also used for that. It's a little unfair to put that ticket on it, though. Black, yes, for mourning, but uh, Coco Chanel's little black dress has got nothing to do with mourning at all. That's party, party, party. Welcome to Gothland. I'm uh, standing on the village green, and Gothland is, uh, what, uh, 12 miles from Whitby and about 17 miles from Scarborough. And uh, Gothland, to all you Heartbeat fans, is known as Aidensfield in the series. And behind me is the Aidensfield stores. And as you know, I play Sergeant Blaketon, and today I have with me a real live Sergeant Blaketon. And here he is, the one and only Sergeant Alan Liddell. How are you? Hello. 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 Now tell me, uh, was it... Was, was it really it like, like that, that in the, back, back in the, in the 60s, 60s, the way we portray it in, in Harvard? Exactly, exactly like this. It yeah. is. It, it, I don't think you can perform it. No, no. Not, Not at all. So, so we get it right. Gentle, lovely life. Well, look, uh, I'm, I'm going to take, take you uh, for a little stroll round Aidensfield now. So. Yeah. Are you ready for that? I am indeed. OK, follow me. Well, I'm sure, Alan, we, we couldn't play the parts uh, the way we play them if it was 1994. What do you think? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have Captain Hell's chances no. doing that. People are different. People are not as gentle as they were in, in my day. They certainly uh, weren't... Um, they're certainly not so uh, well disposed towards the police as they were in those early years. The, police, the, the policeman was a friend and uh, confident, uh, certainly in the rural area. So, uh, I mean, you miss, miss your times, don't you? I miss them very, very much indeed, but only, only then, not now. No. This is why you, uh, you watch Harpy. That is indeed. It Take, takes you back. And still many happy memories. <laughs> now, shall we go to the Aidens Field Arms and have, have one, shall we? We will, yes, yes, yes I think so. Uh, so, Alan, uh, Sergeant Blake, you know, do you, do you, do you identify or can you relate, relate to that character that I oh, play? That? In, in, in some aspects, yes. yes. Not as abrasive. Uh, at least I hope that wasn't. So, Alan, uh, what would you say? Uh, how many crimes would you uh, have to deal with, say, in, in, in a typical month? So you'd be lucky to deal with any some so, months, yes, yes. yes. Uh, it was a very, very little crime. And what would, uh, what would the crimes consist of? Burglary and things like that. It mainly consisted of an odd break, a bit of poaching. Yeah. Uh, Burglaries? An odd, yeah, an odd one. Do you have any murders? Or yes, we, 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 we had. How many, how many in a month? <laughs> <laughs> in 18, 18 years, I remember one at Robin Hood's Bay, two on the moor, and that's about it. Oh, 18, 18 years? 18 years. Now, you, you know. Peter Walker, who wrote the Constable books, I never did which well. Heart, the Heartbeat series is all based on. Yeah. And, uh, but did you know that uh, in the books, that Sergeant Blaketon was a huge fat? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Greengrass was a little tiny weasel. Yes, I've been led to believe this, yes. And I suggested to Bill Maynard that uh, we swap parts. And, but he, did, he didn't think that was a very good idea. <laughs> I didn't know you'd actually done that. You know, I like to shout a lot, and he, he, he has to be loved. No, he does. <laughs> well, I tell you, I mean, we've been here three years. This is our fourth series. And uh, it's been one of the, the best jobs I think any of us have had. And I'm sure that the crew and all the actors will probably, because we love it so much, will end up buying places. If we can, afford, if we can afford it, they must, have, they must have the money to do it. It's one of those places. <laughs> yes, it is. It really is. People, people are very generous. Yeah. And uh, it's been certainly one of the happiest jobs that I've ever had. Yes, yes, I can um, well believe that. And it's been great to walk around Aidensfield, Gothland with you. 
Uh, lovely to meet you. And I haven't shouted once. So. Not once. No, no, you haven't. All the very best. Thanks, sir. God bless. There's something invigorating about walking along a seashore. It must be the result of our maritime heritage. Because the sea has helped protect Britain's identity and independence, we all tend to think about it with a certain amount of affection. But the sea can be a destructive agent too. This path I'm strolling on might not even be here in 10 years' time. Those waves can whittle away insidiously at our coastline and quite literally take the ground from under our feet. It's a problem that's been going on for centuries. And in certain parts, because of the nature of the rocks, it's particularly active. Here near Whitby, we've lost something like 60 feet over the last century. In other parts, it's much, uh, a much slower rate. So there's something in the geology that causes it? Partly. The rocks are very soft. They're often quite jointed, and the sea can exploit those. Plus the fact that the water draining off the top of the cliffs after heavy rain or in winter will wear away the top of the cliffs as well. So we've got it being attacked at the base of the cliff and at the top. Now, the Cleveland Way, which is a heritage trail, runs along the coast for about 40 miles. Is that in any danger? In part, yes. Uh, this particular section, again, that we're walking on, we had to close earlier this year because we had a total of 14 separate falls in a half-mile stretch of path. So for safety reasons, it was closed, and we've now been able to negotiate a new path with the landowner. Is anything practical that can be done to stop the onslaught of the sea? Well, generally, in the open coastline, no. Where there are habitations, house, houses, then obviously the local authority may be able to do some sea defence work. Well, one place they are trying to halt the incursion of the sea is at the little fishing village of Staines, about 10 miles off the coast from Whitby. The local council wants to build a network of anti-erosion boulders, similar to these, running from the wooden section there right across the harbour. It's a scheme which hasn't proved too popular with some of the locals. They formed an action group called SCAR, States Community Against Rocks. Every winter, on a storm, the state itself gets covered in driftwood and, and various other things that are thrown up there. And there's no reason to believe the sea isn't strong enough to throw these rocks up and, and do quite a good demolishing job on, on the property near, near these days. There's a, a, nat a natural outflow here from a stream that runs behind the village, uh, the street. Most of the year, that's just a natural, normal stream. In times of heavy rainfall, the, the water overflows from the normal drainage system into this stream, and it comes out through here. That's going to be right in the middle of all the rocks. It's going to stay there. There's going to be a lot of organic matter, um, vegeta and vegetable matter in there, which will rot down, fester, and form an area for disease. But you, you both must accept that, uh, that the sea has to be halted in some way. Yeah, there are, there are good alternatives. Uh, the, the, the best alternative, which is obviously the most expensive, would be to actually extend the northern breakwater, which you can see out over there. That would actually uh, enclose the harbour, instead of being a northerly entrance, would be an easterly entrance, and that would actually stop a lot of wave activity within the harbour, which is the main problem. Under pressure. Under pressure. Totally destroyed the village, as far as tourism is concerned. Pressure. The council will put the rocks here, just here, and it will wear away at the concrete and expose all the soft underclay. The underclay will wash out through the rocks and the state will collapse. In my opinion, all they're doing is giving the sea ammunition. And, and so, you know, the place for defending this village is out yonder where they started, to the back of the piers, not, not up along this lot. It's uh, just ridiculous. Nobody here's got gardens. We all back out onto a street. This is our garden. And who wants a load of rocks dumped in their own front garden? Nobody wants that. Strong feelings. But the fact remains that unless something is done, by the end of the next century, this charming little fishing village may be nothing more than a drop in the ocean. Right, time to get back to the regatta now, where things are looking less like a regatta and more like a seaside version of it's a knockout.
It was a ludicrous idea, Vicky rationalized. Ludicrous to think that Steve, her husband, would ever dream of trying to kill her. What she'd assumed to be a torrid affair between him and her best friend Louise was probably no more than an innocent flirtation. But the knife, was it really meant for her? Perhaps she couldn't trust Steve anymore. If her life was in danger, she would have to watch his every move. What was he doing? His answer sent a cold shiver down her spine. Rat poison, intended for her? She peered through the kitchen window as Steve opened the container. Her anxious stare worried him, but she had fled. A beautiful summer's afternoon. A stroll by the river was what Vicky had in mind, and she knew Louise wouldn't refuse. As usual, Louise was her bright and cheery self, but Vicky, preoccupied, had other things on her mind. As the chain ferry chugged lazily across the river, Vicky stared into the deep, dark waters. Louise, mildly worried, tried to approach her, but was rebuffed. Vicky couldn't bear to be near this woman a second longer. She had to get rid of her. And instantly, a plan sprang to mind. The thought excited her. Adrenaline raced through Vicky's veins as she moved into action. It took a lot of reassurance to persuade Louise to go rowing. Louise was hesitant. She'd never been comfortable in water and couldn't swim a stroke. A fact not lost on Vicky. The serenity and peacefulness of the river soon relaxed Louise as Vicky gently rowed to an isolated spot. Louise was unusually quiet, unnerving Vicky. For once, Vicky felt the need to talk as if somehow her thoughts could be read. She reassured herself that really Louise was drifting off, daydreaming, no doubt about her husband. Once more, an inner rage swept through Vicky as she eyed her husband's lover. The weeping willows drooped into the boat, offering Vicky a protective cover. The scarf, the stiletto heels. The scarf, this was it, this was her chance. Quietly, Vicky stopped rowing. There was no turning back. She had to win back her husband. Louise hadn't seen a thing. Vicky pointed out the sinking scarf as Louise cautiously leant forward. She almost had the scarf in her grasp when Vicky shook the boat, sending Louise reeling into the water. Vicky sat silently, lost in a trance, undisturbed by her victim's cries for help as she gasped for air, struggling to keep afloat. But she couldn't weaken now. With cold indifference, the murderess rode gently away, leaving Louise to a watery grave. Now, your traditional British seaside snap might consist of a busty woman in a striped bathing suit, or even a kiss-me-quick hat in some of Britain's better locations. Here in Whitby, though, things can be a little different. Yes, you can turn back the clock to the golden days of yesteryear by having your picture taken in the clothes your dear old great-grandparents wore. Or, in your case, Bob, your dear old grandfather. <laughs> Watch the birdie. The town of Whitby is dominated by its medieval abbey, but I wonder how many people realize that that abbey inspired the macabre and eerie legend of Count Dracula. In fact, it was here in Whitby that author Bram Stoker got the idea for one of the most notorious stories of all time. Mina Murray's journal. 11th of August, 3 a.m. Diary again. No sleep now, so I may as well write. I'm too agitated to sleep. We have had such an adventure, such an agonizing experience. Bram Stoker was the manager for the great actor Henry Irving in the last century. And Henry Irving had come to Whitby and he told Bram, he said, what a lovely place it was, just right for holiday. Now, Bram had a little boy. And he thought it would be a good idea to go and have a holiday. So Bram came to Whitby first of all, on his own. So he was a man with a very active brain. 
And he couldn't just sit still and twiddle his thumbs. And he watched people, and he watched all that was going on in Whitby, and a story, he scribbled a story, started to scribble a story down. Suddenly, I became broad awake and sat up with a horrible sense of fear upon me and of some feeling of emptiness around me. The room was dark, so I could not see Lucy's bed. For his characters, he looked at the other people staying in the same house with him, which was in Royal Crescent, Six Royal Crescent, and he put them into the book. They weren't actually called Minor and Lucy, but that, those are the names he gave them. The weather wasn't always good, and he would be confined to his room quite a lot, and he was scribbling, and he was evolving this story that turned into Dracula eventually. I took a big, heavy shawl and ran out. The clock was striking one as I was in the crescent, and there was not a soul in sight. I ran along the terrace, but could see no sign of the white figure which I expected. The town seemed as dead, for not a soul did I see. The time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled and my breath came labor as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, and yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighted with lead, and as though every joint in my body were rusted. I got almost to the top, I could see the seat and the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it, even through the spells of shadow. There was undoubtedly something long and black bending over. I called in fright, Lucy, Lucy, and something raised a head. From where I was, I could see a white face and red gleaming eyes. If you want a good laugh, read the book, Dracula. Don't watch any films, but read the book, because it's really, it's a very funny book. People are always, always asking us where Dracula's grave is. My predecessor actually was uh, reported to the Archbishop of York because he said to somebody Dracula wasn't real and his grave wasn't here. And somebody took it very seriously. Part of it is slightly true. In the 15th century, there was a chap called Flad Dracula. Um, but that is about the only connection. People take him so seriously. And Think of Whitby purely in terms of Dracula, uh, which is really to do with evil. I know it's to do with the overcoming of evil, too. Uh, but they really completely forget the story of Whitby, which is far more important than that. Whitby Kippers. Yeah, fine, come this way. Okay. So, Barry, tell me, how do you get a Whitby Kipper? Well, first of all, we get the herring from Norway or Iceland. Why don't you use Whitby herrings? Well, we do when we can get them, but they aren't available all year, <coughs> year round, like these are, you know. Right, right. So, the frozen when we get them, we defrost them, uh, split them, clean them, and then put them in a salt water brine for about 40 minutes. Oh, yeah. 45 minutes, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gosh, and what about all this? Is this leftovers here? Or yeah, what? yeah, it's leftover, and people buy that to, to eat on toast or whatever. Do you eat this? No, I don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look very appetising like this, does it? Well, once they uh, go through the full process and they get in the shop, you know, I could eat them then. This is a smoking house. Oh, it stinks, doesn't it? Quite oh, a nice smell, really. It is a nice smell, yes. How old is it, then? It's about 100 year old. Um, my uncle who's just retired reckons it's just maturing now. Really? Yeah. Right now, what happens here? Can have a go? Right. If you follow, what do I do? don't like touching them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so your thumb there and your fingers. Yeah. So you feel the back of the hook. Right, okay. And just turn it on. Right, okay. So how many do you do every day? It depends the uh, time of year, time of week, really, but it'll be about 100. 150 kilo today, maybe. Mm. And so, so what's going to happen when you retire? I don't know, really. Derek's got to 
two boys have two girls, they might come in as, you know, same as we did. And do you have reed kippers? Yes, yeah. yeah. You're not fed up with them by the end of the day? Well, I only have a pair now and again, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you over smoke a kipper? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah they, 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 if they get too much smoke, they, they're, you know, they're stiff and hard and very dark. It's mm. got to be just right, really. So how long do you say it goes in there for? It's about a 24-hour process, 18 to 24 hours. Um, they all aren't ready at the same time. The ones at the back, like Derek's rotating now, these are ready for the shop. And then rotate them round two more fires, mm. and they'll be out. Right. As of, they might have been sold as soon as they come out of the smokehouse, you see. And has the tradition changed in 100 years? Is the process still the same? The process is exactly the same. Um, as it was then, as far as we know, as far as we talk to the family, you know. And you're not going to change any of this? We're not going to change a thing, no. The split herrings are cured over an intricately built fire of soft and hardwood shavings. Here, native instinct comes into play to determine the fine mix of beech, oak and pine. And with three daily fires required to complete the 24-hour cycle, the whole of the east side of Whitby fills with the irresistible thick and oily smell of freshly cured kippers, which draws in both tourists and locals in their droves. Right, they say the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so let's see. Oh, they are delicious, so fresh. I'm off to get some bread and butter. Next on today's Big Day Out, it's time to give you the chance to win a relaxing weekend away at this hotel along the Yorkshire coast. And to win today's phoning competition prize, all you have to do is tell me who this gentleman is. This famous explorer was the first to chart the waters around the eastern coast of Australia and New Zealand. Incidentally, he lived here in Whitby for three years, between 1746 and 1749. So, who is that I'm talking about? Is it Captain James Cook, Christopher Columbus, or Vasco da Gama? If you know the answer, call us on this number, 0891 11 4488. That's 0891 11 4488. The lines are open until 12 midnight tonight. And back to yesterday, when we were in Bally Money, we asked you for our competition to tell us where the Giant's Causeway led to. The answer is Fingal's Cave. I think the most attractive thing about Whitby is its air of timelessness. There's a feeling that little has changed here over the passing years. And that impression is emphasized to some degree by the work of one of its most famous sons, the Victorian photographer, Frank Meadow Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe was born in Leeds in 1853, only 14 years after the advent of photography. Fond memories of holidays in Whitby enticed the family to move to the town while he was still in his teens. It was shortly after that that he decided to make his living with a camera, setting up a studio and a disused jet workshop in Waterloo Yard. His deep affection for the town and its people manifests itself in the spiritual nature of his work. Undoubtedly one of the finest pictorial records of life in Victorian England. His technical skills and artistry won him over 60 awards at exhibitions as far afield as Tokyo, New York, Vienna, Paris and Berlin. Though his greatest accolade came in 1935 when he was made an honorary fellow of the Royal Photographic Society. We're now a few miles inland from Whitby at Egton Bridge, home to one of Britain's last remaining gooseberry shows. And if you thought that once you'd seen one gooseberry, you'd seen them all, you'd be wrong. They come in a whole host of varieties, and picking the ultimate winners is not for the faint of heart. Because in this sleepy Yorkshire village, the gooseberry growers of England are about to do battle. 
It's been here since 1800s. As I said at one time, I said before, there was lots of shows all over the country, and uh, I think there was uh, 178 shows throughout England. Every pub and inn seemed to have a show. And I think the First World War was the killer of the Gooseberry Show. Uh, I don't know why it's remained in Ecton. Uh, it's a little backwater, perhaps it's that, you know, untouched by the modern world. The, the judge will decide. Most throws label their own gooseberries as to the variety, but it's entirely up to the judge on the table who names the variety. And he will decide whether the berries sound, and then it will go over the scales, and uh, it will be taken out into the room. But it's very little you can do with a gooseberry. You know, you can't inject it with anything because it bursts. Um, they may try and pass off two berries as the same variety uh, and call one a white note, one a green, but the judges soon spot that. Basically, it's very honest. Everybody has a different formula for feeding them. This year, I fed mine on sheep droppings, diluted in large drums, and they've had a good feed with that every day. Uh, other people will have different methods. I wouldn't eat my berries, shall we say that. You can cover them up. Uh, some people use umbrellas. Uh, it's an awful job covering your bush bushes up. If you get a high wind, it blows the covers about. If you have umbrellas, it may blow them onto the bush. So it's not an easy lot, isn't it? Gooseberry grows a lot. <laughs> of the year for Whitby, really. 20,000 people come every day and uh, I mean, today, Monday, it's been absolutely heaving the town. It's become an event of the North East, the regatta's been going for 140 years. You get this tremendous rivalry between the two clubs, the Friendship and the Fishermen. It's sporting rivalry, it, it uh, occasionally overlaps into uh, a bit of general jostling when the uh, ale is flowing, but basically it's good natured stuff and what a tremendous thing that Whitby, a small town, only 11,000 people can have two tremendous rowing clubs like this. Let's have you. In here. Hold on, lads. Give yourselves plenty of space between these boats. You just sat there. Oh, come along. There's a lot of people who want to take part in these events, especially the men senior. So you'll see 14 or 15 boats. There's only possibly four can win. But it's the taking part for the other 10 or 11. And there's a lot of tactics involved in this. No, 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 no. Well, I suspect there may be just a little bit of gamesmanship. I mean, you get one or two full starts, we've had them already in this race, and I suspect now the starter might be just beginning to lose his temper with the gamesmanship. You! Next time, Sunshine, you can go! Get round there. It's full speed and sink up. I suspect he'll be going up and down saying, OK, I've seen it. Let's get on with it. We've had enough of this. I know exactly what you're doing. If you do it again, you'll be out. Stop broiling the inside! Are you ready? Okay. They basically shared the results over the two or three days, and there's no one club really dominant. Oh, well, I'm sure if you spoke to the the Commodores, both clubs, they would both say that they were 
both dominant at the present time, but they're not. They're sharing the results out, and we saw that over the three days. So they're now sitting down over their beer. Beer pints and they're trying to work out who's won the Wilson Trophy if this is the last one. I think it is, but it's not as easy as one, two, three. There's a lot of paperwork to go before you find a winner. And now, from the ancient abbey, one of Whitby's adopted sons, direct from the Notting Hill Billies, Mr. Steve Phillips. It's a hard road to travel Many long a thousand miles from a home I dreamed last night The star was shining Shining bright On the one I love There's a light Down in the valley Whispering trees In the pine wood grove Unseen of Forever hold, hold me close to the one I love. Bring you gold, bring you silver, diamond rings and a sweet red rose, but no earthly charms in this world for, for the now, the one I love. Lead me down by silent water, be still my heart, you lonely soul, evening star. Well, that's all from Whitby. Now, you've probably noticed that Victoria's been wearing this tight little neck scarf throughout the entire programme. Yep. She's taking no chances. No chances. Don't trust those Whitby vampires. Tomorrow we'll be in Lincoln. No vampires there. There are, however, Lancasters, and we'll be taking a look at them. Before we leave, I brought this little present for Bo. You hang it on the wall, Bo. It has a barometer. That's to tell you when it's warm enough to wear your cider drinking hat. There you go. <laughs> I shall tap it every morning at Clinton Bar. Now, for Bob and Bo, I've got them. Whitby for you to colour, and I don't want any arguments on the way to Lincoln. That's to keep them quiet. I'm having the blue crayon, and that's agreed now, OK? <laughs> I bought this, and there could well be a row over this. We can either use it for my young person's rail card, or Bob's senior citizen's oh, rail card. Oh. Not that old. 
It's working with you that makes me look so much <laughs> Johnny Simono and Lincoln from uh, Mo Victoria and myself. Cheerio. Jim, Jim Rockford's, Rockford's girlfriend, girlfriend goes missing at 2.20 this afternoon on BBC One, and the trail leads to a fugitive crime boss. It's fresh and in your face. How's it looking? The only